Thank you for joining us and sticking with us online, in person, after lunch, into the afternoon hours. Um, we're, I'm excited to have this panel on uh, the future of European defense capabilities with uh, three notable guests. We can introduce them uh, on the far end there. Max Bergman, director of the Europe Program Center for Strategic and International Studies. Here in the middle, Lieutenant General Giovanni Vagnoni. Deputy Director General of the EU Military Staff, European External Action Service, and joining us virtually, uh, Diego de Ojeda Garcia Pardo, Head of Unit for Coordination of Foreign Security and Defense Policy at Secretariat General of the European Commission. That's a long one. That's a good <laughs> one. And my name is Kevin Barron. I'm the Executive Editor of Defense One. Uh, we are a national security news website uh, here in Washington. I'm a Pentagon reporter by trade, have been for, for many years, and pleased to be here. So I'd like to ask all of our panelists to give us your introductory thoughts, uh, and we can, we can start big and we can go small. If you want to jump in, jump in. Let's make this uh, a collegial good discussion. Uh, but some of the questions that, that Atlanta Council would offer us in, with uh, transatlanticism in mind really play off what lots of, lots of the other panelists and speakers have said today. We're all talking about Ukraine. We're talking about how the future has changed in the moment that we're at now and what's to come. So starting big, what will a strengthened European defense look like? And how will it fit into this transatlantic defense cooperation? Meaning, what are the barriers that you all see to the assumption that many, many either experts or just observers are making when we read the news that Europe has come together in a way like never before. There's new strategy documents, there's new cooperation between, you know, every, on, down at the industry level all the way up to the heads of state level. Uh, a, a, off, lots of this started before Ukraine, but much more since the Ukraine war has happened. So what are the challenges that you see before us in, in the more immediate sense? And uh, perhaps, General, we can start with you since you're in person and the closest to me, you win. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, well, let, let, let's start by, by saying this. One of the principles of war is surprise. And uh, I think it is wise trying to apply surprise always, even in this uh, occasion. Now, this panel deals with capabilities. And, uh, and normally, capabilities are related to creating capabilities, meaning means to be used at war or in crisis management. But uh, instead, I think that a capability is made of different parts. Yes, assets, everybody's talking about, cooperation between the industries, uh, what it will be more useful in the future. Should we concentrate more on hard assets, tanks, ships, airplanes, or maybe focusing on hybrid uh, instruments, cyber, first of all, uh, disinformation and whatever. But my, but my thought goes to instead the why should we do it? Why should we create these things? What is useful for to have something if then you don't have the training, if then you don't have the mindset necessary to use it, if then you don't have the strategy on the base of the employment of these assets. So I would say that the capability is made of different parts. And while everybody is concerned on creating some costly assets, I would be much more concerned in how do we get the other parts. Are we really ready to spend, employ our time, our wits, our brains in devising the proper way to train our people? Are we ready to spend money in training? Are we ready to create the mentality of our decision makers, not only military, also civilian, for the benefit of our society? So I would like to put in your minds this idea, this wider perspective. Please do not think that once we find a way to cooperate and to create a beautiful asset, a marvelous tank, then we have solved our problems. 
our problem is still there. Our problem is how to employ it in the best way. And I leave this as a reflection for you, as an introductory remark. Am I being short enough? It's, it's uh, the stage is yours, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so a warning to, uh, don't get, don't get uh, too focused on just the hardware. Uh, there's far more to it. It uh, is necessary, but. Right. Max, uh, you're, the, you're the academic among us here. So uh, <laughs> what's the academic view of the challenges ahead before people's noses that they may not have seen about this, this, this goodwill feeling everyone has about European uh, togetherness? Well, I think one of the fundamental problems of European defense uh, is that Europeans don't think about defense as Europeans. They think about defense in terms of their own national perspective. And so you have the continuing problems of fragmentation, of, um, of lack of coordination. I think Europe collectively, the European Union collectively, spends uh, roughly 200 billion euros a year on defense. That's a sizable portion, but you don't get the sort of equivalent bang for the euro. So I think when we think about European defense going forward, this unity, this sort of reinvestment that we're seeing, uh, I think will really be lost unless that increase in defense spending is really coordinated. Uh, where I uh, read that you know, there are roughly more than 25 different pieces of artillery or, or types of artillery within Europe. What that does is it makes it really hard for Europeans to fight together, to deploy together, to operate together. So, what is national defense in Europe? It's European defense. And so I think there's a really critical role for the European Union. Uh, and I, I, I commend the European Union for putting on this conference in the, in the Atlantic Council for, for organizing it. Because I think it is in, imperative that the, in, I think especially here in Washington, that we begin to see the EU as a, as a pivotal defense actor that can strengthen NATO by really working to do what the EU does best, which is integration. We've done it on every sector. But, but not on defense. And that is where we have a real problem when it comes to how, uh, how defense of Europe looks. It's not integrated as well as it could be. I want to talk more about integration, but we'll give our third panelist a chance to react to the initial question again. The, the challenges, the worries that you see right before our noses <coughs> that maybe others don't see. Uh, Mr. Hede. Thank you very much and, and good afternoon and apologies for having to intervene through teleconference or video conference because uh, I couldn't make it to Washington, which I would have been uh, a much more pleasurable experience. And actually it's not the first time that, that I speak in this forum, so it's a pity that I cannot be there. Um, also through the VTC, I didn't get to, I didn't get to, at least I didn't retain the name of my predecessor uh, in, the, in the microphone but I sign up to what he just said completely. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, uh, we are in, in the European Union. We're trying to, at the very least, complement what our member states do uh, nationally so that they do it as well, or at least partly, at European level um, in terms of the, the developing capabilities, uh, spending more, spending better, including joint procurement, and then, as the general was uh, saying, trying to come up with a, a common uh, or at least a, a more convergent uh, military uh, doctrine, narrative, methodology, uh, culture. Um, and I think that we're making a, a lot of progress in the last few years. Uh, and uh, uh, you said that this is uh, not all related to Ukraine. Uh, and certainly it isn't. We would have to do this homework uh, even if Ukraine was not there. But the fact is that we started almost, I mean, Ukraine didn't start on 24th of, of February. The Ukraine started uh, with Crimea. Uh, and, and we were uh, almost coincidentally, uh, the first text that the European Commission put forward uh, on defense was in June 2013. So right before the first wave of this Ukrainian crisis, um, uh, which, highlights uh, the urgency of, of uh, and, and, and also the magnitude of the task that we have ahead. Um, but let me say first and foremost, uh, first, first for, at the forefront, uh, a number of things. The European Union does not want to replace what its member states do. Uh, so inside the European Union, defense is primarily a national competence and will remain so. 
and a national responsibility. It is our member states that have the responsibility to, to, of defending their citizens and those that are members of NATO, which is 21, hopefully soon 23, they also have a responsibility of shouldering uh, the collective effort to defend the, the European continent from, from particularly from the Russian very elevated threat. Uh, the, the European Union, Brussels, uh, does not want to replace member states on defense and let alone replace uh, uh, NATO when it comes to collective defense. Uh, the European Union is not into collective defense and will not be. Uh, that is a, the core task of NATO and, uh, and it is very well be taken care of. And we want to cooperate through the development of the European the Union defense dimension. We want to cooperate so that uh, the contributions that our member states can make to NATO are uh, even more useful and even stronger. And we are, I believe well, we are in the, right, uh, in the right path, not only in terms of capabilities, but also in terms of countering hybrid threats or military mobility and a number, a number of other important files where we have to do what we have to do for our own sake. But in addition, what we are doing is tremendously beneficial to NATO. Thank you. Well, thank you. No, you, you just, I'll continue with what you were just saying. You described two things that EU is not. It's not responsible for collective defense, that's NATO. It's not responsible for national defense, those are the members. What is the EU taking on in this larger context? You know, this may be basic for some of us, but remind where things stand. I mean, the, la the, the latest big muscle movement is this strategic compass that, that came out this year. Um, but where, where can NATO uh, help build the, the joint capabilities, the joint agreements uh, that are needed or that are wanted to make something like the strategic compass uh, you know, become a reality? A question for either of you, I think. Well, I, I, I think that NATO is, well, let's step back one point. Uh, there is a lot of confusion, in my view, between defense and security, okay? Uh, if we talk about the defense of which NATO is responsible, because all the allies decided so, including 21 member states of the European Union, then we are talking about applying a certain level of force to deny or to defeat an attack. And this is defense. We just go to, to the a dictionary, any of it. This is the definition. If we talk about security, then it is creating the conditions that will prevent this attack from happening, which is much different. It is wider. It implies actions in several different fields, including, if necessary, the military, but with a different stance and a different attitude. Now, European Union, through its CSDP, is trying to create security conditions all around the continent, and therefore, the amount of military forces needed to contribute to this are much smaller than what NATO would need to defend the same continent. So, if we understand these big differences, then we also understand that NATO, uh, which, by the way, doesn't create capabilities in the same way that European Union doesn't. The Allies create and made them available to the Alliance. NATO doesn't own capabilities, right. except few command and control something. Huh? Right, right. And this is another big uh, misunderstanding. Neither of the two organizations owns military assets, except few exceptions. Now, if we, if we consider this, then we will see that still the member states or the allies are responsible for creating the capabilities. The, the, the problem is the choice to make these capabilities available to one or another organization. And the problem is to for the member states and the allies to understand that the famous complementarity that we're talking about, never, it never existed. N nobody were until now able to define which part of the angle belongs to NATO and which part of the angle belongs to the European Union, which in my view is very clear, 
everything done outside the continent and not war is European Union in the field of European Union. Everything that could be done, hopefully never, to defend the continent is a responsibility of NATO. Capabilities need to be carefully planned in order to satisfy both these purposes, including command and control, decision making, and blah, blah, blah. So, Max, then, with how have things changed in these last few months for building joint capabilities, uh, with the EU's role in it? Um, have, what have you seen? Well, I think. I think we should applaud uh, the European Commission's latest proposal where they would essentially provide 500 million euros to incentivize European countries to take all the increase in defense spending that they're doing and buy things jointly. Uh, and I think when we think about what is the role for the European Union in defense, to me, it's a there's a huge financial role where during COVID, the European Union did something for the first time it borrowed. It borrowed 800 billion euros to ensure its economic recovery, economic stability, uh, and that was a path-breaking step for the European Union. But from an American perspective, if you can borrow for COVID, if you can borrow for economic recovery, you can borrow for defense. And here we have a security crisis. We have a situation in which uh, Ukraine is desperate for additional resources, a different, a, additional military equipment. The United States has allocated more than $50 billion to Ukraine. And then you look at the discrepancy between what the United States has provided and what Europe has provided. Our economies are roughly equivalent. Where's the EU? The EU could be borrowing money to provide support for Ukraine, to do what it's doing with the European Peace Facility, which is this new mechanism, which has provided 2 billion euros to essentially backfill countries that are giving away equipment. And so when you look at the defense budgets of, of European states, and they're, you know, no one budgeted to give away really expensive artillery. So then how do they pay for that? Well, that's a role that the European Union, I think, could really come in and play. And when we talk about duplication and, and complementarity, I mean, that, this is duplication in the sense that there's multiple bill players, but that's good duplication. And I think we need to, the, at least on the American side, need to really sort of control, alt, delete our talking points when it comes to EU, NATO uh, uh, concerns and all the caveats that the United States always wants to place on EU, NATO cooperation and really just push that to the side. The EU has a clear role, uh, it, it's doing it, and we should be encouraging it to do even more. And so when the president goes to a European Council meeting as he did, he should be pounding on the table say, allocate more money, spend more money, and do it through the European Union so that then not, uh, member states can uh, ensure that they're spending collectively. And I think that's, that's a, a key vehicle. Diego, what do, what do you say to that when you hear those comments? Uh, I want him in my team. <laughs> um, that's that's what I say. Uh, well, I I I didn't I didn't think it was accurate the way in which uh, um, you described the 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 contributions to Ukraine from the U.S. and from the EU. It's not only that we've provided two two billion in in weapons, uh, or that we are reimbursing our member states for providing two billion in weapons, because some of our member states are providing weapons without getting reimbursement. So that would come in addition. So let's say we have the EU and its member states have provided, one could estimate, three billion so far. Uh, but in addition to that, we've provided 4.6, over 4.6 billion in humanitarian and financial assistance. We are, and we have just adopted another uh, decision a few, uh, a few days back uh, to provide 9 billion uh, additional euros, uh, million, billion euros in, in, in macro financial assistance. So I would say that, that both the US and the EU are uh, providing a lot of help to, to, to Ukraine in all areas, that are, and there are many uh, where this is needed. Uh, you know, for instance, we've interconnected our electricity grid with, with that of Ukraine and, and a number of other things, and we are all doing what we can to, to help Ukraine withstand the aggression, including on weapons. But uh, clearly, the, the US is a much more, uh, is a much stronger uh, defense uh, actor in the world, in NATO, and, uh, and therefore its ability to support Ukraine militarily is bigger. Uh, 
and, and I'm happy that the, the U.S. is providing uh, as much assistance as, 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 as it can. Uh, when it comes to, to the role of the European Union, uh, yes, we don't want to replace our member states when it comes to the national level. Yes, we don't want to replace NATO when it comes to collective defense. So what, what do we do? Well, I would say that there are two, two, two dimensions or two areas in where we work. On the one hand, our CSDP, General Manione mentioned it, our Common Security and Defense Policy, which is uh, expeditionary crisis management missions around the world, notably in our neighborhoods, South and East, uh, but also uh, what we can do in order to uh, stimulate or to lure our member states to spend better. And that is through, uh, through joint procurement, but also joint development of capabilities, and then, uh, and then a number of, of uh, other less tangible aspects, such as uh, synchronizing defense national planning, for instance. And, uh, and, and we have different actors in the EU that are dealing with all of these things. So for instance, the External Action Service is in charge of this expeditionary crisis management missions, and within this strategic compass that we have adopted for ourselves uh, a few weeks back, uh, uh, we have uh, agreed to improve our CSDP to make it more effective. Uh, but also we have the European Defense Agency, which is dealing with some sort of uh, annual exercise with all of our member states to, to, to sort of to identify and tackle loopholes uh, when it comes to their national defenses. And then you have what the Commission uh, is doing, which is implementing a number of um, EU programs, named notably the European Defense Fund, which is for joint development of capabilities and joint research, uh, defense research, but then also now this new instrument that uh, we are we are putting on the table for this for this 500 million for joint procurement. 500 million is a lot of money. Obviously, I would like to have myself, but it's not that much when it comes to joint procurement. And yes, it would be great if we could borrow to 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 produce or to or to procure uh, equipment for Ukraine. Mm or for ourselves. But unfortunately, this um, uh, unprecedented uh, instrument of borrowing, uh, which was used for, for fighting COVID for, for, uh, for the, for the, for the re rehabilitation of our economies following the COVID crisis, um, the consensus is not yet there within the European Union, and it has to be by unanimity so to use it uh, for the case of defense. But, uh, but yes, it's, a, it's an area that we are exploring, and hopefully at some point in the future, we will be able to, to use it. Thank you. We're, we're within uh, about eight minutes, and I want to make sure we have time for questions either from the audience or from online. Uh, so if you have one, please wave, wave furiously um, and catch my attention. Uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned the strategic compass earlier uh, as this, it, it's, you know, Advertised as a big moment. It is a big moment. It is a big first. I'm a journalist, so I'm less impressed with documents than I'm with actions. And I want to know what we should expect to come next or to come forward, to come after the strategic compass. Uh, let's start specifically with Ukraine and then major, maybe the larger context of European strategic autonomy, a controversial concept still. What should we expect? Should we expect that this is going to lead to um, not just more agreement in, with EU members that more needs to be done, but actual in, continued increases of budgets, continued increases of armed forces and capabilities. Um, more, more recently, or in the near term, an increase of, of weapons or arms or any kind of other assistance to Ukraine or something more. What should we expect? I need to take this. I think that out of the strategic compass, we expect that member states increase the awareness they have of the general situation and on what it should be done. Because not, one thing that it worries me, particularly uh, regarding the Ukraine war, is the focus, extreme focus, that we are putting on the Ukraine war. Now, my question, it, it could be, are we sure that this is the main effort of Russia? Are we really sure that Russia intend to occupy Ukraine and, and, and go on with the effort towards Europe? Are we, do we really believe this? Or could it be that this is a secondary effort 
to distract our attention, to focus our resources there, and in that way to distract us completely from Africa. Do you know how many countries in Africa abstained from voting the UN revolution condemning Russia? Mm. And do you know how, in how many of this country Wagner company is present? And do you know in, in how many of this country particularly important and rare materials are? If you don't know, then how can we make evaluation on where is the main effort of Russia? I tell you, in my view, the main effort of Russia is hosting Western countries from Africa. And when this will happen, then we will have to ask them if we want our gas, oil, and whatever. And this is the best result they can achieve. And while we are concentrating on the East, they are acting to the South, and then it will be a disaster. And we will need to employ our capabilities on the Eastern Front, because we were unable to prevent this to happen. Sorry, I took too long. I don't want to steal time to the army. But think about that. Not always what it looks like is. Even if it took a lot of casualties to the Russians to perform what they did, who cares in Moscow about people being killed for their fatherland? Who cares? So I would, I would ask to put more attention to the South. I would ask uh, our leaders to concentrate on the possible effects that are not secondary at all of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I stop there. Good question, yes. Yeah, I, I would just say quickly that I think, I agree with you, with strategy documents, sometimes the, the significance of them is that you have them, right? Uh, and I think that's the significance of the strategic compass, really, is that it shows that the EU is trying to think strategically about the world. And to me, that indicates that the European Union is uh, a union that is looking to play a more of a global role. And so I think that's, for me, the, the major uh, significance of this. Well, you know, strategy documents are, are, they're fine, they're necessary, but they usually have, they mean, they have, they have a purpose behind them and it means to, it's to impact change, right? And it's one thing if national security leaders can agree on something, it's another if their publics can, if yeah. their capitals can, if their industries can, right? So the same question, Diego, to you out there in the, in the internet land. <laughs> was, uh, I was at a meeting with NATO from uh, three to five or six European time, obviously earlier today. And um, as you know, in NATO, in the Madrid summit next week, uh, they're adopting this strategic uh, framework, uh, mm -hmm. renewed strategic framework for NATO. And, um, and it was the NATO colleagues that were saying that contrary to yours, Ours is much more strategic and less filled with action-oriented uh, paragraphs or, or elements, <laughs> because the strategic compass, whether you call it strategic or not, it is a, a, a it is a it's, it has it's a listing of a number of things of, of very tangible commitments with dates that the member states have committed to to attain, and of of the I think it's 80 something, uh, more than half are in this year in, to, in 2022, so. Uh, as a journalist, uh, I understand you fully. Uh, you can disregard the, the, the strategic compass as such. It's, it's, it's yet another milestone uh, because, for instance, we, for the first time ever, we have a common threat assessment. Uh, but that is all uh, papers and, and concepts and agreements. But what it matters is the, is the many action-oriented uh, uh, deliverables that, uh, that we are going to be uh, delivering upon uh, in, the, in the coming months, uh, more than years. And, uh, and those will be uh, quite uh, substantial, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and uh, improve our ability to, to be a security and defense actor uh, for ourselves and in our neighborhood and project uh, stability and security over our neighborhood, which is something which I think is very much needed. Thank you. 
With, with one minute left, since you have the floor, I'll give you the final question that just came through online, which basically says, how can the EU help lean in to, to uh, create more interoperability of defense systems and more harmonized procurement process across Europe uh, in the current state of affairs? You have 45 seconds to answer that one. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first of all, our member states will continue to have the ability to buy whatever they wish from wherever they wish and however they wish. Um, so, you know, they can, they can buy whatever they wish and they can buy American or they can buy Japanese and they can buy whatever they wish and go at it alone. But we are not, uh, we cannot constrain that and we don't want to. But what we can do is offer them incentives. Uh, yeah, I would not dare use the word subsidy but a financial incentive that, uh, that makes it more attractive to undertake the path, which is more complex, of buying it together with others. And if you buy the same thing, by definition, you improve interoperability. That is our recipe for, for that. Right on time, and we've been given a hard stop for our panelists. I'd like to thank all three of you for your insights today and for our audience for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for the next panel right away. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.